So uh, it's the seventh meetup. Who uh, has not been here yet uh, to this uh, meetup before? All right, welcome. A good number of people. And then um, I want to start by uh, just thanking some people. So uh, events like this don't just happen by themselves, and it certainly couldn't happen with just me. Uh, so we have an organizing committee. So uh, Amy Nisor uh, from uh, Research Teaching Learning. We've got Anthony Suen in the back. Uh, Sybil is on our, among our uh, conspirators here. Uh, and then Jason Christopher couldn't be here today, but he is also on the planning group. And I want to thank Carolyn Wynette, uh, Executive Director of the Skydeck, because she uh, lets us use this space. And uh, just so you understand a little bit about the Skydeck, because they are one of our sponsors, I wanted to turn it over to uh, Sybil, who is the uh, Program Director up here. Thank and she'll tell you a little bit about Skydeck. Well, so again, welcome to Skydeck. Uh, a quick kind of overview about what we do here. As you may know, we're part of UC Berkeley and we're one of the tech accelerators on campus. And we have 145 startups coming through our six month program. Um, we are in the midst of fall 2019 cohort. So it's always really busy here, Monday through Friday. Uh, we have an open door policy, so if you're really curious to kind of see what it's like during the work week, please feel free to stop by at any time. Um, usually it's like a madhouse and their founder is hiding out in every which corner. But really we're an accelerator to support, we have three key tracks. One is the accelerator track. Generally there are about 25 companies, we invest 100K, um, and we, we're really hands on and work really closely with them to ensure that they are able to successfully raise on demo day. We also have an incubator track called Hot Desk, it's about 100 companies, usually pre-revenue, um, but they have a prototype or MVP that they're working on trying to figure out product market fit. And finally, our third track is the Global Innovation Partner Track, which we partner with Global Accelerator that send companies to work with us for about three months. And this time we have companies from Taiwan, China, and Italy that are here with us this cohort. So yeah, it's a lot of fun, very dynamic, positive, vibrant um, environment. I welcome all of you to stop by. If, any of you guys have a startup idea, feel free to reach out anytime. We're always looking for talented founders. We're really happy to have uh, the UC Berkeley Cloud Meetup here, and it's always a pleasure to, to welcome you guys. Uh, it's just, you know, part of our ecosystem is nurturing just, you know, an environment where there's innovation and discussion, good discussion happening. So, yeah. Thank you, Bill and Anthony and Amy for all of the work organizing. Uh, so, I always say this at the beginning, so why, people ask, why do we have a cloud meetup? This is not a cloud evangelism meetup. Uh, it's actually a cloud investigation and discussion meetup, and someone told me it resembled uh, sometimes an out of control graduate seminar. Um, so, really, you know, a lot of times, Berkeley is very decentralized, so people who are working on the staff don't always talk to academics and maybe even not students. And so this is our place where we can get people who are doing research and who are doing administrative stuff and using or exploring cloud computing and get them together. So I always ask at the beginning, how many of, and, and this is the public um, facing piece of it. So we're also trying to bring in people who are maybe live nearby or work in industry. So I always ask, how many of you are academics? So we're a little light on the academics today. Um, and then how many are, of you are on the IT staff? Okay, so quite a good turnout from IT. And then how many of you are uh, in a startup or visiting from the greater Berkeley uh, community and saw it on meetup.com? Oh, really? Okay. Right. So um, the other thing is that when people are going to present, you'll notice that we ask them to start with why. Like, what is the interesting story? We don't really like lead off with the technology. We look at kind of what they're trying to do, what problems they're trying to solve. And then how did that sort of bring them into the world of cloud computing and, and then what challenges did they overcome or not overcome? Uh, and so that'll be the sort of nature of the, of the thing. But this is a meetup. And so even though we've been socializing, uh, please 
turn to your neighbor. We're going to take a minute or two for you to introduce yourself, tell them why you're here, and say hello so everybody can, uh, you know, you can meet and mingle just a little bit more. So okay, go Someone pointed out I didn't introduce myself. Um, I'm a terrible MC. I'm Bill Allison. I'm the university's chief technology officer. Uh, and so I'm one of the sponsors also. Uh, this actually ties directly to a key component of our cloud strategy for the university, which involves helping bring people together and create a community and a culture around changing the way we work. So that's that's my bit of it. And so Anton, come on up. Uh, Ellen.ai, and hopefully I said that right, or it's like Ellen, is uh, it's about decoding culture and building and helping companies build a positive culture. And I didn't want to say some of the names of the companies that you're working with because I don't know that they're public information, but they're working with some really large name brand companies, helping them build a positive culture, especially when people are telecommuting and stuff, um, using AI and the cloud. So, Anton. Um, just stay between the two monitors and make sure to speak into the mic so we caption what you're saying correctly. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I'll do my best. Whenever I'm out of the space, I'll do something. Okay, we are part of Skydeck Berkeley. We got accepted this July. We are part of Fall Cohort 2019. And yet, thank you. We are, we are measuring culture in the companies in a very different way. We are integrated into the communication channels such as Slack, Zoom, and we are going after G Suite and Microsoft Teams. We grab all the data there. <laughs> then at this moment of time, every CEO, CIO is freaking out because like, you'll get all the access to all the data. And then we anonymize it, we code it, we make it impossible to identify one exact person from that whole file. Oh. And we start analyzing with machine learning algorithms to bring up some indicators like mood, collaboration, how, how people feel themselves included into the, into the community. This is a very radical way to calculate those indicators because if you know from your experience at the companies, usually it's once per year that the company is reaching out to you and saying, how do you feel about working in it? here, a company or any organization. And based on that one year survey, they're making the next year proposals for the different kinds of activities. But what's happening between those 12 months is usually kind of a gray area because there are some one-on-ones, there are some meetings here and there, but no one really is taking care of keeping hand on the pulse and the dynamics of the change, and this is 12 months' period of time, sometimes six months. But the change is happening faster nowadays, <laughs> a bit faster. What, how we started this? Uh, we asked ourselves what was the future for. And as we were working on remote, we started digging into the remote. Myself, Oksana is here, my co-founder and our CTO who is based in Europe, we all were on remote, and we were a little bit frustrated about it because when you're working not from the office, not from you don't have cooler conversations, and you have your team around five time zones, it's a little bit different. And the trend said that by 2025, number of people working on remote will be over the number of people who are working in offices. So this is the future that comes in about five to six years. And we help companies to prepare for the future and to build the culture that unites and integrates and keeps mood and collaboration at the top of the organization's priorities, along with other <coughs> indicators of success that can be really different. It can be stock price, it can be revenue of profit, it can be number of students enrolling in the, <laughs> uh, in the programs. Overall, uh, we started with the idea of five stars, so we were like, okay, let's come and ask employees on the scale from one to five, so it's like Uber for satisfaction. How was your day? And we will track this, and if that, that could be three stars in 
two weeks will notify people department. We've piloted twice. The first thing doesn't didn't work obviously. Five stars is too too basic. We we change into the communication the questionnaire through Slack. Two weeks engagement, that's all we got. People are not eager to respond. And then we figure it out. There was a lot of objective data in Slack. Uh, last week when we were talking to Slack and we were explaining what kind of data we can track in Slack, they wanted to meet us for a very separate special meeting because they didn't track it. After we gather all the data, it is transformed by a machine learning algorithm into the indicators that are composed of different parts. So let's say you want to, to look at your organization's engagement and you have four more sub metrics that help you to understand what drives the engagement and stuff. Ah, almost forgot, we are working with Africa's <coughs> Culture Computation Lab <laughs> uh, that has years of learnings and researches on culture. This is how we are shaping our machine learning. And it's every year 100% cloud based. We live on AWS and we use Google NLP sentiment analysis for a part of the machine learning algorithms. And that all will be covered in the second part. We have Richard with us, who is our expert for the machine learning. I'll cover the business case in more than two or three minutes, and then we'll go directly to public. By tracking the numbers, by gathering them, we can decode different areas like engagement, communication, or recognition. And you won't believe how much information is stored already in your public available bit. So we don't we, we do not go into the private channels. <coughs> this is considered to be too much for us. We go only into the public channels, and everything that is happening in public channels nowadays is that is shaping the culture of the organization. There's one thing when you communicate directly or you're in a closed group, this is one kind of the behavior. Another behavior is shaped when you're communicating to the larger group. And these are the mindsets and the beliefs that are lately corresponded to, to the behavior themselves and to the way people perceive the organization and take the decisions. What Ellen does next, Ellen analyzes the correlation between those indicators and brings up actionable insights. So once per week, uh, people office or the person who is responsible for the organizational mood from a different, from a different direction in the organization, they can get some tips and tricks on what to advise to the leaders in order to shape the culture the way they would love the culture to be. The retention and all the other indicators are coming soon. We are toward the prediction. <laughs> now we are measuring. In the future we will be predicting how the things happen. At uh, this moment of time, the consulting that the organization gets improves the communication within the Slack channels and emails and all the communication that is for the remote or for those. And just, just to clarify, everybody now is on the remote. If you have any communication tool on your mobile device, you're considered to live on remote. <laughs> because you can reply from your home, from your car, when you're picking up kids, when you're in the restaurant, whenever you are, you can reply that means that you're not in the office, that means that you're on remote. You don't need to be 100% on remote to, to live remote life. And this is the description of your remote life. Any questions so far? Cool. Seven minutes into the business case, I guess it is covered. We are happy to be here with SkyTap. Everything is really cool. If you have any idea, apply. <laughs> this is an amazing program with a lot of advisors who will help you to grow. Bill, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm giving it over to Richard Liu, who graduated class. Uh, he, he did his PhD uh, organization for uh, management for organizations. And he's our speaker today to cover the technology part that is about computation when we are here. And Richard, can you hear us? Yes, can everyone can hear you? Well. Yeah. Great, fantastic, thank you, Anton. Uh, speaking of remote work, I'm really glad we can make this work virtually. So happy to be here and thank you for setting us up. 
Um, as Anton mentioned, I am one of the founding members of the Computational Culture Lab at Berkeley Cross, um, and now I'm the resident data scientist at LMDA AI. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of a brief overview of our kind of ML framework, and then kind of talk a little bit about how cloud computing fits into that, how it amplifies our ability to kind of push data through those pipelines. Um, so let me give you a sense. Right now, I'm kind of building version two of the ML framework at Ellen. And let me share my screen real quickly. Uh, okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yes? Okay. I'm going to assume you can. Uh, okay, so let me just cover a brief portion in the short time that I have. Um, but like, like Anton said, we're, we're kind of analyzing Slack messages and communication data. And you can imagine that you can build out measures of these using tokens, sums, and people are using words like good job, amazing, nice, that might improve the mood. You can take the sentiment of what people are saying, and you can build metrics around that. And so what we're doing with ML now is we're taking the raw text messages, and we're, we're taking even more features from that. So there's like metadata, when these things were sent, um, and there's a bunch of different NLP features that you can build from these Slack messages. So things like the syntax, the structure, are people using a lot of nouns, adjectives, are people using a lot of these, like certain words, what are they actually saying? Um, so we're using like word embeddings for um, kind of the, the state of the art in NLP. And we can also reduce all the unique tokens that people are using down to a certain number of vectors and we can put those in our models. And from there we can predict things uh, like targets, like idealized responses. So let's say you have someone asking a question on Slack and you can pick out certain features like they're using their question mark or they're using words like who, when, what. Um, and you have a certain response time that's ideal, right? Ideally, people respond to questions in maybe like 30, 60 seconds. And you can build a model that predicts the re response time based on those linguistic features. And so if you build that model, then you can start to say, hey, look, this team is responding more slowly than they should have responded to all these messages that should have received responses in 30, 60 seconds, right? But it's taking this team on average, you know, two minutes, five minutes. And then that feeds into something about their communication styles, may decrease the overall mood, the overall engagement of the team. And you can imagine that you can take any number of these targets and then fit them to features and build any number of these models. So you can expand this ML framework in kind of infinite number of ways, depending on what you're interested in and what's really relevant to team health and team communication. Um, so that's kind of the basics of our ML model. And, and NLP is, is very interesting because it's really powerful. Um, but to get that kind of power, let me. There's the cloud. This one? Cloud? Cloud, cloud. I guess Richard is retired. Oh, Sorry, did I pop off for a moment? <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me, let me pick up kind of where I think I left off. <laughs> Hopefully that's, that's the last thing you heard. Um, but NLP is really powerful because, it, you know, there's a lot of state of art measures, like you can do synchronization, you can do all these really cool things with really cool data. Um, but to, to purchase that, it takes a lot of power, right? Um, to understand what people are saying, to parse out the sentences, to parse out the words, it takes a lot of computing power. And that's where cloud computing really fits in. Right, so I won't give away the secret sauce, right? But one of the features in our models is uh, for contextualized word embeddings. And that's you know a powerful deep learning model that translates like words into a bunch of different vectors with a bunch of different numbers. Um, and it takes a lot of computing power. And so just to give you a sense, to process about 500 different Slack messages using that model takes about 60 seconds. And that doesn't seem like a super slow time. But once since you get to 36,000 messages, hundreds of thousands of messages, that could take hours or days, right? And that's not really feasible if you want real-time instantaneous results. So the, the unique aspect of NLP also is that it's parallelizable. parallelizable. So you can take one sentence, pass it to one computer, take another sentence, pass it to another computer. You can do this across a bunch of different computers, right? If you have something like Amazon Warehouse Services, you can just spin up an instance pass all your different sentences through and get something back. And so with the power of cloud computing, you can make what could have taken hours or days down to fractions of a second, right? And that's really fast. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we are. We have a lot of cool data coming in, 
And my job is really as a plumber to build those pipes so that once the data comes in, we can push it through um, and get all our predictions, all our models, all our everything that we need um, kind of with the data that we have. So that's just a high level overview. I'm happy to answer any questions about ML, about NLP, about the, the framework, cloud computing, anything that comes up. Thank you, Richard. And just to give you a feeling of the volume, Richard just said that 500 messages takes you a few minutes. We've analyzed 2.6 million messages so far. We have 4,300 active users in the system for generating content every minute. It's kind of kind of a volume. And when you need to process that type of the volume, AWS services could rocket skyrocket into your channels. Uh, Google NLP takes a lot of money as well. So sometimes you need to integrate several solutions in the cloud together and parallelize all the analysis and then combine it together. Any questions? And if, if any, I'll add the mic so much you can hear them. Sure. That's great, thank you. I was wondering, are you also analyzing emoji? I know we use a lot of those in our work on our stations over Slack. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That, that is not a paid question. <laughs> it, it is a great question. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do. There are hundreds of emojis that Slack provides. And there are emojis in the text center, in the messages that are not transferred like actions of the emojis. So we differentiate them, and we can grab the emojis just typed, and the emojis and the reactions, and differentiate the, the type of the emoji, and then put it into the system. This is part of the metadata. Another exciting metadata for me was time of work. If it fits the work day, it is out of the work time. If it is during the weekend or not during the weekend. And by analyzing the data, we figure it out that for one company, if they work during the weekend like 100% time because they had a lease or whatever it was, next three weeks in a row, it is down to zero during the weekend. So they're burned out. And we could predict <laughs> when, when, when that would come. So that's, that's how deep the data is. Any other question? Sure. Um, I too think this is actually totally amazing. I'm also thinking of the use of Slack um, as a tool primarily for, te for techie folks. Um, and I'm thinking about age, age differences and biases and whether you're looking at those. And I was also thinking of gender specific sort of um, bias in your AI algorithms in terms of you know what what guys say to each other might be different than what women say in terms of right on, good job, um, super duper great. I'm sure I could think of some other things that you wouldn't want to tell us that you see on Slack. <laughs> <laughs> Diversity and inclusion. Richard, do you want to cover this? I see you're, you're nothing. Sure, yeah, that, that's always an issue with, with AI models, especially the more black box you get them. Um, so there's research showing that kind of um, in the in workplace, uh, male and female coworkers will respond with different sentiments depending on who they're talking to, um, and and so you can imagine like if a woman says like oh I just finished this project, uh, a male and a female might respond to that differently with different kinds of sentiment. Um, so one of the things that we can do is kind of just track that sentiment, um, and kind of getting on the anonymization, uh, we can't actually get to the, the actual gender of the person. Um, like Anton was saying, we try to keep things very private so we don't know the identity of any single kind of speaker. Um, but you can track the sentiment that follows and you can look for those patterns and you can identify them and you can link them to other patterns in, in, in a very simple sense. Thank you, let me add on this. Uh, there is an option for the companies to upload their organizational structure, and in their organizational structure, they can mark employees by the gender if they want, or any other diversity recognition. Gender is just, just one of them. And they can, they can then slice and dive the data based on that tax or qualities, but it is not available to know who exactly. They can just group the data in a very specific way, and diversity and inclusion in Bay Area is a very big topic, so everybody 
everybody's first action is to diversify <laughs> and then to see how inclusive the community is. Thank you. Exactly. There, as you mentioned, sort of what work groups are targeting. I mean, I could, I could imagine a technical work group, say software engineering. Uh, their their Slack language might be really essentially references to tickets, things like that, where there's a technical vocabulary and documents that are sort of out of out of purview that aren't aren't even met up with respect to this, or the very very involved. Where it's more interesting, like the executive hiring committee, who I don't know if you're including here. Uh, I'd be interested to know if, if some companies are. Uh, their, their, their interest might be more along the lines of how much of this is discoverable uh, through, through you know, subpoena or something like that. And that might be a top level concern, and, and then, which really might not appear at all in the conversation. So, what kind of work groups are you targeting? What level in the company? What degree of technicality or non technicality? Can I, can I reframe the question to, to make sure I understand it correct? So there is there is some specific language in different departments and different organizations, and if we are taking into the consideration the specifics of the language. Like finance. Like finance versus healthcare Why? versus tech versus Facebook versus suitors. <laughs> you wanna you wanna add on this, Peter? Come out. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's really cool the advances in LLP that allow us to track those different changes across work groups. So right now what we can do in LLP is we can look at contextualized uh, words that basically take into that other context. So you can imagine a software engineer talk about, talking about a bug means something different than maybe an, an HR person talking about like bugs in the kitchen or something. Right? And NLP can actually figure out those differences and understand what people are saying in those two different contexts. But you can imagine that there are kind of universal patterns of communication, right? So if someone's talking about a bug, I'm not gonna talk about like what I ate for Friday lunch, right? I'm gonna be talking about that bug as well. So there's like linguistic matching patterns, there's sentiment matching, there's all these kind of parts of human communication that are cross-functional, cross-groups. And once you have those contextualized word understandings, then you can start to fit those universal patterns of human communication that link on to like patterns of good engagement, patterns of good communication, so on and so forth. Right? So once I can understand that a software engineering bug is different from an HR bug, then I can start to track the health of the team in a more general pattern. And the words themselves, like bug or ticket or summary or report, they have no, they have neutral sentiment. So they won't impact the sentiment itself and they don't have metadata behind them. Or the metadata is universal. The timestamp, the number of upvotes for this event message. So what, what you're saying, the contextual analysis, is the next part is deep dive for the system. So the system itself is neutral, agnostic to, to the language that makes it universal for any area. Because it is the system that analyzes the behaviors and we are done with the time. Right. right. That's my unfortunate job is to uh, keep it rolling along. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Thanks, Helen Richard. Dye and Anton and um, Richard. <laughs> Next up, if you've been coming, uh, Anthony needs no introduction. He's the program manager of the Division of Data Science. Uh, and he's going to talk about an NSF funded initiative that's joint between UC San Diego, the University of Washington, and Berkeley uh, called the Cloud Bank. And it's going to uh, be transformative. Uh, first, some questions. Do people know about the Cloud Bank? Do you have any idea what the Cloud Bank is? Do people know what the Cloud Bank is here? Raise your hands. Okay, well, I have people that... Uh, is the mic on?
understanding, I mean, this is the generic pitch about what the cloud bank is. Uh, the researchers, something to provide researchers and educators across the country uh, solutions to how to you know, implement their needs in the cloud. It's kind of like a hybrid entity that leverages the abilities of various experts on the campus and what the cloud providers and other resellers can provide. Um, I guess maybe a, the original story of how I got involved in this project is looking at the supporting other universities that are adopting data science infrastructure that use, you know, frankly, a pioneer. And uh, what we've seen was, like, if you're a community college or even, you know, some Ivy League schools that I don't even name, they couldn't implement exactly what we offered. And not only did they lack some technical expertise, but they, they never had access to some free cloud credits. So there was a kind of a discrepancy, and we were finding our kind of a, our technology or methodology of training people that uh, was not, wasn't really affecting large scale, large parts of the community because of this technical barrier to entry. So we were thinking of something like this a while ago, and back in 2018, and uh, you know we thought NSF was soliciting, was getting some people at NSF were also hearing bits about these needs that you know universities, uh, you know, and research institutions all were facing, dealing with their needs in the cloud. So it was, it was heartened when this came through uh, at the end of 2018. That's where the original proposal from NSF came came out, and. Uh, Stage. Um, I guess uh, before I move to the pain point, you know, of course this meetup is about the cloud. Um, what are the regular challenges people experience in the cloud? Setting up infrastructure for research education. And just get a raise of kind of some comments from the audience. What are the issues? Um, allocating resources and funding to research and development. Anything else? Yeah. I kind of gave away the slide a little bit. Sorry, showed you some things. Um, but I think uh, again, this is. No uh, Yeah, often you know, CIOs could overbuy cloud credits. So, uh, there is you know, pricing, billing issues uh, that people, you know, a lot of the university administrators not, not be, not, may not be perfectly aware how to deal with. There is also you know there's what they will call uh, I think the folks at SD call it resale market utility. There's a lot of credits that end up not being used sometimes and like. Oh no, it's lost it. So uh, there's a s different but slightly similar issues with researchers and educators. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, other institutions uh, that are not as fortunate as Berkeley, I would say, view maintaining kind of this cloud solutions uh, time consuming and <coughs> a significant learning curve. Uh, they find trouble dealing with managing all the very, keeping track of all the credits. Uh, they, they have trouble managing the different user needs, uh, you know, uh, Processes. Though. I mean, especially it's apparent in classes. When we train. We have 1,500 students in this data eight class, and uh, you know, uh, we don't want all the credits to be used. Up, especially since you know it's unlimited access right now. Other institutions have adopted methodology to restrict control. Uh, this is probably even more problematic in research projects, where if you don't manage the, the access right, uh, certain users could use up all the credits you have very fast. Um, so. Again, some of the basic concepts of uh, the cloud bank, I mean, some of the, what it's designed to serve, I would say first and foremost is probably, uh, you know, support and training needs. That's one of the key roles that we'll talk about what Brickle will provide. Uh, it provides an account setup and account management support, uh, consulting and training service to how to, you know, set up your you know, research or educational infrastructure in the cloud, and even proposal assistance. Uh, it really tries to aggregate bulk buying of uh, various requests in the cloud or kind of credits. Uh, so you provide users cost savings, if you will, and hopefully make it easier for even the cloud providers too, to, instead of dealing with uh, thousands of different requests at once. Um, it's also designed to really limit kind of the issues that you know novice implementers in the cloud experience, like runway spending, kind of a uh, lot of unused credits and you know misallocations. So again, the division of labor, uh, and you have to be frank, it's mostly a San Diego operation. SDSC is leading this portal development and doing a lot of the, long, the planned the cloud negotiations. Uh, e, uh, the eScience Institute UW is going to be supporting a lot of education and outreach and training needs. Uh, our specific niche at Berkeley is to provide this computer science and data science educational infrastructure. The, we already have some of these uh, out in the public already, the zero to data eight, the zero to Jupyter Hub guides to allow institutions, whether it's, you're a small uh, high school even, to a to large, uh, you know, public institutions to 
run data science and educational infrastructure. Uh, this map is, uh, again, I don't want to, you know, you can, you can take some pictures of it, I don't want to dwell too much into it. This is the proposed kind of a, a vision of the, the cloud bank with this cloud bank portal as kind of the central uh, you know, part of it where, you know, users, whether it's PIs or ENSF and, uh, you know, everyday users can really figure out, find documentation, get support, figure out the usage needs and allocate all these credits. Again, this is not yet done and I'll show you the, the potential timeline that I think SDSC is working on. Um, and at the bottom is kind of just it's a cloud bank organization, which is nominally led by SDSC with Berkeley and UW being involved. Uh, again, this organization is a collective uh, where we will support users, we'll negotiate some pricing, um, and also monitor charge and usage back to the PIs and process awards through that. Again, this is still very early stage because the award was just processed last August, essentially. Uh, solicitation went out in December or November of last year, and uh, there's, so let's move to the, maybe the timeline. Um, well, initially, since it's not even, the, the, the portal's not yet ready, but I think that the goals for the coming years are essentially to support the NS, some, several NSF projects within the computer information science and engineering projects. Uh, folks at Berkeley, UW, and uh, SDESD and UCSD will have kind of a more immediate access in the coming year, I would say. So, you know, expect some announcements in the coming year. Uh, long term, you expect NSF funded kind of research to be leveraging this cloud bank service, uh, and even NIH aware research. So there's going to be potentially, if it all goes well, a lot of uh, funding uh, slash uh, uh, kind of synergies with this uh, cloud bank. Uh, corporate research can be, you know, foundational research can also be plugged in, and potentially even international collaborations. Because in some ways, I feel like other countries have a very robust on you know kind of a research infrastructure. Uh, that you know, the, the universities already leverage. Uh, one of the examples in Canada, they, they have a national kind of a hub for kind of these Jupiter, uh, Jupiter hub for all of Canada for education. Needs. We don't have that in the US and might be years ago. But, uh, and then for more exact detail the timeline for the first year, I think people are thinking about essentially designing, uh, yeah, the workflow still needs to be refined, if you will, uh, with the NSF and cloud, uh, the cloud providers. Uh, and, and regular users. Uh, so there'll be a lot of user testing, kind of account management work. Uh, so again, we, we hope that it will be done in the next year. The advisory will reform, the education and outreach and training will be scaled up and, and designed because we haven't actually started to reformat the existing work we already have. And uh, yeah, in theory, the cloud provider contract negotiations will also be beginning. In the long run, uh, two to five years from now, uh, Everything will be operationalized. You know, operational support will be coming from NSF. If I didn't lay out the details, it, this this is a very small brand in the big scheme of things. It's not designed to buy cloud credits. It's only about a million dollars per year, uh, funding mostly SDSC's kind of operations to set up the infrastructure with some additional training and uh, other support uh, for UCSD, uh, for UW and UC Berkeley's efforts uh, to provide trainings. Um, but yeah. How do you think this will change the way Berkeley provides support for people using cloud computing, say from an IT organization perspective or something like that? That's a very good question. I feel like uh, maybe I can ask others here to uh, entertain. Uh, again, this is about my favorite. and This is really a question that this is so new and so experimental. I'm not sure. I think uh, it will. It doesn't hurt. It will help. And especially for you know those early experimenters to really see you know, how this will scale up. Because I think uh, the future is in the cloud, of course, and you have a kind of a government kind of partner uh, or consortium to really address the various needs. Uh, we'll be helping out with it. If the training itself is useful. Uh, I don't know about the aggregation piece yet, because that's still, that's, I don't know how unprecedented it is, but um, you know, that's why I want to learn from here. We will have feedback about this, these concepts. These are all relatively new in my opinion. It's like the government's working with cloud providers too are credits of supporting essentially everybody's research or education. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> are you vendor agnostic or do you work with all the vendors? I think it's vendor agnostic, so any vendors here, don't worry. It works with everyone. And it really tries to better direct people from which vendor they should. I think in some ways, I'm speculating a little bit, maybe a price suggestion based on needs uh, for that various vendors provide. Because I feel uh, many researchers or educational uh, organizations, they feel a bit lost given the 
you know, the amount of new things coming about in the learning curve. Uh, so I think. Do you assist yeah. with the vendor selection? Like which cloud vendors? Again, that's something to do with as SDSC, if you will. I think uh, there will be guides out there, and uh, I feel like right now, a lot of the Jupyter Hub stuff that we apply at Berkeley is really founded mostly on GCP, for example. But I know a lot of research on campus uh, and also infra uh, kind of uh, uh, administrative infrastructure is run on uh, AWS. So again, we can show you examples, uh, but it's you know it's still early stages, and I think uh, the folks at SDSC, SDSC will be actively working with various cloud providers to figure out what is a effective solution. Oh, sorry. Hey, um, I, maybe I'm going to a dark place or a futuristic place, so bear with me for just a minute. And I'm thinking about this idea of a cloud credit exchange, and I'm thinking about it in a market-based way, which is kind of the way you guys are approaching it. You know, when you think about buying credits and, and then giving them out and selling back used credits and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm going to a weird place, but I'm thinking about all of our IP addresses right now and the IP uh, space that is all taken up, and there's a whole black, not black market, I guess it's a regular market on reselling IP addresses. And I'm just thinking, I don't know, I'm just thinking about like what, so this is great because it's supporting researchers and, and it's in higher education, but it also could theoretically be a model that is market-based model without the without the support services around it, but just a market-based model on credit, cloud credit exchange. And I just sort of, because the price fluctuates and it goes up and down, um, it might be interesting to sort of use this as a test case for what it looks like as the prices fluctuate and as you're sort of selling credits at different, buying at different rates and selling them back at different rates. I just think it's fascinating. Somebody's probably, some economist is probably already doing that, but um, but you're doing it on a smaller scale. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. yeah. I think there, there's a, some entertaining thoughts about this kind of concept going on at Berkeley. Uh, but I think uh, I think this is going to take it incrementally. We don't want to see kind of abuses in the system. We want to help. This, right. this is designed to help institutions across the country, large and small, to figure out how to better utilize the cloud. And I hopefully the cloud vendors also realize this is a helpful thing for them too to really uh, improve services that they actually don't provide. They, they can't service the needs of thousands of different researchers in terms of specific their research specific research needs or educational needs. That's a lot of work and. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, universities themselves can help each other to uh, better provide solutions. Um, so yeah, I, I guess there's a, there's still a lot of experimentation. This is so young, and uh, there's not many presentations about this in the first place. And uh, th and this is a consolidation of like a one hour presentation that uh, folks at SDSC have given. But uh, no, I think there's a lot of exciting ideas for here. And uh, do people have, do they have comments or ideas or dark fears or anything? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very interesting comment about, uh, I wonder how the vendors might feel about you doing right. arbitrage on, yeah. <laughs> on their services. Um, it's just educational. On the other end of the spectrum, one of the issues is the fear for anybody half, half knowledgeable about uh -huh. services is the fear of getting locked into a particular vendor. Right. And part of that, you know, I'm kind of doing Alexa development, and they just yank Node.js under, from up underneath my lambs. Um, and this is part of legend called legend and lore, along with a whole bunch of technology. <coughs> I noticed education was one of your 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 in your remit there. Yeah. Um, so so how, how 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 can you address that that fear of getting locked in without building some kind of a not just an accounting uniform platform, but a, your own cloud platform that hides that stuff? Well, I think again that doesn't awesome. seem to be at all. Right. Um, I, I think some of the support services that are being designed are designed to help, designed to help users that uh, cannot get locked in. I think that's, I didn't, you know, it was a minor detail in my opinion, but it is actually a very important detail uh, that's embedded with this whole concept. You know lock in and allow for flexibility uh, among the various platforms, if you will. So I, I think there, that's in the design process, I think, still. And uh, all this feedback that Berkeley has or folks at SD and UW will be actually, uh, will have, we can't have a bigger voice in the design of the system. So, especially since we'll be the first university to test out this model uh, going forward. And, uh, and then we're actually going to be developing a lot of this training content, at least for the educational side of that infrastructure. I think Berkeley has a, a great lead in right now. So, questions or maybe over time? There's no more questions. We'll keep it moving Have a chat later. Thank you. Thanks. Final speaker tonight.
tonight is a special guest coming here from UC Santa Cruz. Perry Robertson is the technical program director of uh, security and cloud. It's nice to see that together in one place. And she, um, actually, you know, UC Santa Cruz is farther ahead in, in, than probably most of the campuses in the UC uh, in terms of adopting cloud as their sort of forward overall strategy. So Carrie and I talked about having her come here and share a little bit about what she's learned and what they've learned as a campus and uh, some of the lessons learned and pitfalls and so we can avoid it. Uh, so with that further ado, Carrie is all <laughs> Let me summarize, it was perfect. There was no problems at all. <laughs> that way we can just move forward from that. Okay, uh, so first of all, Bill asked me why. Why do we want to move our enterprise applications to the cloud? A couple of reasons. Uh, we were out of space, so researchers are really successful at Santa Cruz, which is fantastic. We want to serve to that audience. That means they need to put their physical hardware somewhere. And we have one data center in the bottom of the building. Uh, we won't talk about earthquakes or floods or anything like that. I'm just going to say we needed to get our enterprise applications out. It was the easiest thing to move, uh, which is a little bit ironic to say. Uh, we had no new resources. We knew that IT was not going to get more funding to do more interesting things. We needed to be efficient with the funding that we had and build tools to make ourselves better. Um, and we, need, we did look into four different options, using our data center on-premise for our hardware refresh, which we do every four to five years, um, using an off-site data center in San Diego, uh, looking into our on-premise cloud, and then a cloud provider, and we ended up choosing AWS. Uh, so the cloud benefits, most people in this room already know, availability, scalability, flexibility, security, and really just simplified architectures can exist in the cloud. It depends on how you do it. You can also do those things very wrong. Um, but in general, people do them and they get benefits from that. The UCSC benefits were around uh, allowing ourselves to buy infrastructure or use infrastructure in a way that actually met our peak needs, but also met our downtime, right? So for a, a university, there's about two or three days a year where we need crazy, crazy, like the day people find out if they've been admitted to UCSC is a very busy day. Um, but perhaps the middle of winter break is not a busy day. So we were having all of this idle capacity with our on-premise uh, infrastructure. Another was for our business partners, being able to spin up a non-production environment, like a test environment or an upgrade environment at will. Right? You have an upgrade you want to test out and play with? Well, let me just spin you up an environment and you can play with it and when you're done, I'll throw it away. That's like unheard of in on-premise land from UCSC. Uh, we also were able to be financially responsible in our non-production environments that are not used uh, after hours typically or on the weekends, we were able to turn those off. So we're using Lambda and Jenkins and we have a moth. I have business analysts who can start up a whole non-production environment when they want it and then they shut it down. It's, it's something we didn't have. Um, on premise and then also automating cloning. So I just had to clone my identity management system. It took me one hour to take my production data into my identity <coughs> management stage environment on premise. That would have taken me a solid day and a lot of people. Um, it's all automated. So those are some of the benefits. Uh, so how did we do it? Uh, first of all, you have to have a great team, which I was really lucky to work with an amazing group of people. So I'm standing up here by myself, but there is many, many people behind me who made this possible and I couldn't have done it without them. Uh, we went forward with an intentional strategy to move all of our enterprise applications, PeopleSoft, Banner, Identity Management, to the cloud in two years. We had two years to do it. That's crazy in higher ed time. Like, I know in startup land, that may seem like a lot of time, but in higher ed, that's like earth shattering fast. <laughs> uh, so, we went forward with that we were going to transition as much as we could, right? We didn't want to just lift and shift, but we also weren't going to go crazy and, and rebuild everything perfectly for the cloud. We needed to get started and get it there. Our team was new. They didn't have cloud expertise, most of them. So we needed to give them an experience and a chance to grow and learn. We couldn't just expect them to be experts on the cloud from day one. That's not a reasonable ask. So then we would move to the cloud. We would optimize, kind of tune the dials, I like to say. And then if we got to a place where we were bored, I don't know if we're going to get to, we could completely transform all of the legacy inter enterprise applications. Uh, so the strategy that we took, it's kind of a wild one. First, we wanted to build our team's confidence. So we had them just build a simple web application. It didn't really matter. It was really just a hands-on training experiment. So we had them build a simple web application to get their confidence up and know that this was a real thing and it was possible, right? We had to prove it was even possible at a university. Then, uh, we decided to go big. So we're looking at moving some enterprise applications. How do we convince our business partners this is a good decision and we're confident with our own 
ability to do this. So we decided to move our identity management staff, which meant that if we weren't successful, nobody on campus would log into anything for a while. Um, so, but if we did it, then everybody knew that it was possible and that any, you know, nobody was going to have a conversation with me about if PeopleSoft could move to the cloud once I have Shibboleth, LDAP, Grouper, Campus Directory, all the password reset. Once I have those things there, nobody's going to have a conversation with me about if I can do it. They're going to know I can do it and it's just a matter of when. So while it was a bold choice, it was really effective. It also showed our team we had a lot of confidence in them, which I think was really important when you're building self-esteem with people in the cloud. The cloud's a crazy place. There's so much to it. You have to show them that you believe in them to really get them motivated to keep going. So that was our go big moment. Um, and then we decided we would move all of the enterprise applications concurrently. So we would move, we would kind of break that team up, that move identity management, and have them all running in parallel um, so that we could kind of grow the expertise. So what did that look like? Well, I had 12 beautiful phases. It was fantastic. It all made perfect sense. And then I had a project plan, and it was color, it was so pretty. Like I thought about printing out and on the walls of my office just to like have the pretty colors. It's amazing. If you ever need one for a director, let me know. I will just send you this. Don't spend time on it. Um, and so everything worked exactly as planned. Right? There were no problems. Everything just it was perfect. Okay. But that's not really why I'm here. I'm here to talk about the lessons learned. We did successfully move our enterprise applications. It took just over two years. I want to say two years and about six months. Um, so we were really proud of that. That's a big deal in higher ed. Um, you gotta kind of know your audience. I realize in startups, that's a little slow, but for us, it was amazing. Uh, so the lessons learned, I think that's what is the most valuable to this group. <coughs> Traditional project management will not work. You have to keep adjusting yourself. That beautiful picture, it's so pretty. It has so many lovely colors. It was not useful very long. Um, pushing boundaries of what's possible. Challenge your assumptions, right? You know how to do it on premise. Why do you have to do it the same way? We really need to question that. Required versus ideal. Uh, this is one of my favorite. So patching is important, yes. Do you have to have patching the day you cut over your enterprise application automated? Probably not. You could probably go forward, you could do it manually a couple of times, you could automate that later, you could. Uh, we had a problem where people wanted to compare how mature our on-premise architecture was with our cloud architecture. Well, that's not fair. That's like comparing an adult with a baby, right? Like you gotta give people time to grow. We were new to the cloud, so it took us some time. Um, calculators don't actually calculate. Uh, I have a whole lot of feelings about the AWS cost calculator, and there are AWS people in the room, and they know that I have a whole lot of feelings about the AWS cost calculator estimating accurately. Mostly you don't know what you're going to use. So how can you guess what something's going to cost if you don't know what you're going to actually use as far as services? Uh, account structure, that is a whole conversation on its own, scaling accounts. If you want to have that conversation with me and you're talking about current accounts, please do. I will save you a lot of pain. Um, and then preparing for unrelated blame and rumors. Uh, so I didn't know when I was migrating Enterprise Apps to the Cloud that AWS was the reason that Scenic had a network outage. It wasn't, right? But that was the initial spot. We were in a place on campus where any problem was AWS. I also didn't know that AWS was gonna shut down their data center in Oregon. Okay, they didn't, but that was a rumor that I had to dispel, right? So just, you have to be prepared. It was kind of a joke each day. I'd be like, what, what did AWS do today? Um, so that was, that was an important lesson around the process for us. Uh, the technology, so in AWS and all of the providers, the options change every day. If you try to do a plan and say, I'm gonna build my infrastructure this specific way, it will change. Within that day, there'll be a new service, there'll be something else. So you need to keep evolving. You can't lock it down. I don't know that you would be effective if you tried to plan all of your enterprise applications for three months and say, this is exactly how we're gonna build them and then never look back. I think you'd miss a lot of opportunities. Uh, we had a governance body to help make decisions. Uh, sometimes what we like to call it was the Coke versus Pepsi decision. It's great that you love Coke. I love <coughs> Pepsi. At some point, we just have to pick one and move on. Um, so that was a special, um, I actually threatened them that I was going to decide. If they didn't decide, ended every debate perfectly. Uh, project goals that foster exploration. So we definitely had a timeline. So we wanted people to grow and explore the services, but we really had to time box it because you could explore services for, so you're with me, yeah. You're like, yeah, I could do that all day, all day. So you got to be careful with that. 
Uh, using consultants, uh, consultants are amazing. The challenges you have with consultants in any environment exist even more in the cloud because there are more choices, right? So there's so many more services, really narrowing them down and having them do the way you need things to be supported is challenging. Uh, the cattle versus pets uh, is, a, is a real thing. We just had an LDAP failure and we were structured in a way that we lost one and it didn't matter because we run three availability zones, campus didn't notice. It was like a huge win for our team. We're like, sure, go ahead. Kill an instance, I don't care, I got two more. Uh, so you have to be prepared for that. And then one thing that technical people really struggled with was not always getting to the root cause analysis of every problem. You just sort of have to let go of it, and that is a mindset that is hard for some engineers to absorb. Uh, as far as people, uh, you have smart people. We all have smart people. Let them work. Don't say you're a DBA, you can't do anything but DBA work. That is not helpful, that is frustrating, right? You would be frustrated, yes, he would be very frustrated. I uh, encourage your team to explore all the cloud services and identify best practices. Uh, whenever people fail in the cloud, you really need to help them grow and make that okay. That's how you explore. If you're not failing, that means you're not trying. Uh, widely communicate progress. Okay, it was kind of cheesy, but we put up door stickers. We wanted people to know the project was happening. We wanted people to know when something was accomplished. Sometimes we forget to celebrate those things, so we definitely took time for that as well. Um, and then I like to group, um, the people that I got to work with into four buckets. Um, they were people who were scared of job loss, which was something that was not a concern for Santa Cruz, uh, but they were just kind of scared of job loss or possibly the new technology. They knew how to do their current job really well and they kind of weren't looking to change their world at all. Uh, we had people who, were, who didn't get to work on the tool that was migrating or on the system that was migrating simply because of what their work was assigned. Um, so that was kind of a hard point for some people. Uh, resistance to change. Uh, some people weren't so sure this was going to happen. Uh, so I got to have a lot of good hallway conversation with those people. And then my favorite were the overzealous engineers who were like, all the fun things, I want to do them all, Carrie, I want to do them all. And I'm like, that's <laughs> awesome, but we got to keep going. Uh, so those are some of my lessons learned with people. Uh, and then Bill asked to kind of throw in some advice. I'm talking really fast. I do this all the time. I'm sorry. Um, some things that I would recommend, some of these I did, and some of them I didn't, didn't, I didn't do, and I'm not going to tell you which ones, but these are all the things that if I were to do it again, I would make sure people <laughs> paid attention to, and I'll tell you off the record. Uh, intake assessment. Not everything is ready for the cloud. Not everything should go to the cloud. Take some time. Think about that. Otherwise, perhaps you might be halfway through a migration and discover that you cannot move that, and you will be abandoning that work. I don't think that would happen to me. <laughs> and I would encourage you to do an intake assessment so that it doesn't happen to you. Um, solidify sponsorship. So making sure that everybody in your organization is prepared for this change and supports it. Uh, we had a lot of management change during this project and that became a challenge. Uh, funding model, it would be good to talk about a long-term funding model. We had our project funding totally figured out, uh, but our campus wasn't ready to have a detailed funding discussion around how to work with the cloud. It's kind of a, a new idea, CapEx, OpEx, you know, RIs, there's a lot of different ways you need to consider that. Um, governance, some decision-making body is some center of excellence, it's really important. Uh, Hands-on experience, so we sent a lot of people to training, uh, which was great and a wonderful foundation, but we found until they were actually doing something in the cloud, it was not helpful. Um, and also the, the training is great, but it, it has to be generic because there's 4,000 services that you have to learn about. So you're not gonna get into the details of which one you're using. Um, so I think that one's pretty important to make sure. That's why that web application we had them build was so successful is because they took the time to learn the tools. They'd already been to training, which they needed to go to, but actually learning how to use them themselves and experiencing that was really important. Uh, organizational structure, so this will undoubtedly change your IT organization. It did for Santa Cruz, uh, and I'm not sure that we knew exactly what it would look like up front, so that's something I would spend some time on is where, we, where you think you'll, your organization will end up. Will you need cloud engineers? Will everybody be in the cloud? Will you be hybrid? Are you cloud agnostic? You really need to think about those types of things up front. Uh, you won't have the answers, but you should have some conversations about it. Um, one of the best things uh, that we did was we had buy-in and support from the security and the finance team from the very beginning. It's really easy to forget those people. But they really matter, right? They really, really matter. Uh, so the security team is important. If we didn't have their buy-in, we wouldn't have been able to get anywhere with our business partners. That was our number one priority was to get the security team on board. I got the statement out of our CISO that said, 
we are more secure in the cloud than we are on premise. That was like amazing. I just like I wanted to wear a shirt walking around to everything I had. That was like, oh yeah, I said this. Don't even don't even start the is it secure conversation with me. Um, and then finance, you know, you have to support. You're really changing their world as well. You you really are. How you're going to fund this? Uh, you know, I, I start using all these acronyms. They're a little bit uncomfortable with, and we've got to kind of get them on board and understanding what this is changing for the finance team. Um, it would have been helpful if I was able to point to the exact cost of services on premise because the number one question I got asked during the migration, well, is this cheaper? And my answer was, what did it cost on premise? And then we would talk in a circle for a while. And then eventually we would just walk away from each other. So it would be good, it would be good to actually know what the costs were on premise if you can really dial it down. Because in the cloud, you can you can pinpoint down to what is it, the second? I think there's certain services that are available per second, right? That doesn't exist on premise. Electricity at a campus is totally handled different than it might be. Uh, so I won't go too far there. And then also, the one thing I didn't do, I was actually talking to Bill about this, we didn't use students. I don't know why, like, I have no idea. But what a missed opportunity, right? We're, we're right next to Silicon Valley. We have all these amazing computer science students, and we just didn't use them. I don't know why. So I should have been out there talking to professors, guest lecturing certain classes, getting people interested. It would have given them a great chance. It would have helped us a lot. That was just a miss. Um, that's all. That's mine. Questions for Carrie? Yes, I hear your eyes. Okay, yeah. Hi, I'm Allison. I'm in the Information Security Office at Berkeley. So I guess. I'd love to talk to you. Sure. But, so my question is about that, like, comparing costs and the apples to oranges problem. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at this for our identity management and we've moved to Route 53 for high availability, which is awesome. But if you look at our, all of our infrastructure in our Berkeley private cloud, as opposed to moving it to the public cloud, and you use the Amazon cost estimators, we're not seeing the cost savings. Mm -hmm. But if these tools aren't accurate, and we can't accurately determine what it's costing us in the data center, and these tools aren't accurate, how do you solve that problem? How do you show that actually moving this would have some cost savings? So that, that's fair. I'm sure the tool is accurate if you know what to put into it. I didn't know what to put into it because I didn't know exactly how it was going to be built until it was built, right? So that was part of the problem. There's also so many knobs to turn on that calculator that it's, it's a little daunting. Um, I can say, we should talk offline, the identity management services is the, the one that I can definitely stay as save money in the cloud. So we have Shibboleth, we have Grouper, we have LDAP, uh, we have a web like PHP, uh, but we're also in the most control of what that system needs. We don't have business partners to kind of help shape that. We're able to, within IT, shape what that what the needs are. As long as identity management is working and people log into things, they're happy. Uh, when I take it down, they don't like that. So as long as it's up, um, we do okay. So yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you offline. That is, it is hard to calculate, um, for sure. That's definitely something I struggle with. I like the, the model that I, I've used is, you know, with our strategy, we, we've moved it and then we optimize. So I've been able to save money through our eyes. Um, there's some other cost saving measures that the UCs are working on that can help as well. So there's a lot of, I kind of look at it as like, I'm gonna give you the worst sticker shock and then I'm gonna make it better. So I'm a hero rather than you know, promising that a certain number will get hit and then missing it. So that's that's my approach. Um, and so far, I'm still employed, so that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Jen Stringer, the deputy CIO Hi. here at UC Berkeley. Um, my question is about: Did you actually accomplish the rack savings that you had hoped? And I'm just thinking about your data center footprint, and if you could talk a little bit about that piece, because. That's a key driver. We don't have that issue right now at, at currently in, in our space, um, but it's certainly something that we're keeping an eye on. So what did you end up saving in the end? Yeah, I, I can't speak to the exact rack numbers. or I can't do that. Um, I can say that I can get you information offline. Um, and then I can also say we uh, received a large uh, HPC grant, and mm -hmm. that had to, there had to be room made for that, mm -hmm. and there was that there is room available. Uh, we have a power constraint right now in our data center. Um, so it's not physical space, it's power. Okay. So any yeah. enterprise applications we could move out of the way helped. But I don't have a good answer. Yeah. No, that was helpful. Thank you. Sure. 
for questions. So when you guys are uh, starting in the very early days, so did you bring on uh, consultants that are very generic that could help you with the whole AWS environment or like cloud environment setup? Or you did you bring in uh, consultants that are specific to technology like high identity management consultants or um, like data warehousing technology consultants? Like what kind of consultants do you bring in and what kind of help they give you initially to have that cushion? Yeah, that's a great question. So we used AWS consultants. We had the expertise on the specific applications and the what the services were in-house. Um, what we didn't know about the cloud was what we didn't know, right? So we had some expertise brought in. Um, I personally found that uh, a more challenging conversation because they wanted to do things the way that they were familiar with. Uh, they wanted to reuse templates that they had created, but we didn't want to use templates in a certain language or something like that. So it became a little bit challenging. I'm not sure that we didn't get their ROI we, was, we were expecting. Uh, what we did use is, I think everybody, I'm totally selling you out, Matt. I think everybody here has access to, uh, through Berkeley, the Solutions Architect group, right? Matt's sort of agreeing. So if you're part of the higher eds uh, and in IT and nice to the guy with the plaid shirt, um, then you can get some help sometimes through, you can put in a ticket and they can give you some help to get support on specific questions you have around services. So we did use our AWS Solutions Architect a fair amount for questions that we had about specific services. So that was helpful as well. And we were able to direct them by saying, I want to learn more about Lambda. Tell me how I would do this specific thing. And they could help us triage that. Is that okay, Matt? Okay. Yes, I, I'll put your home phone number. <laughs> Hi, I'm Isaac Magid. I work in the central IT organization doing business and finance. I'm interested in learning more about the team and more so uh, the size at the peak of your implementation and the team that you have now as you're kind of maintaining and still optimizing. Okay. Um, both in terms of numbers and types of skills that you have in your team. Okay, I like to call them a small and mighty crew. Um, so right now we have a team of cloud engineers that there are three. There's an architect and two engineers. They're fantastic, and they lived and breathed this for the past two plus years. So they are well versed in what we have at the cloud. Um, as far as during the migration, we didn't have any extra people uh, brought on, so everybody was doing their day job and the cloud on the side. Um, so they're an amazing group. Uh, I would say there was about 20 to 30 people involved in the migrations at any, any stage. Uh, what we did do for identity management when we started, we had about 10 to 12 people. I kind of locked them in a room for a week or two at a time. Um, but they all got together, they removed their barriers, and they really formed as a group and were able to execute this fantastic job. I mean, it took them longer than the two weeks, but that's how they kind of got the architecture figured out. Uh, then the plan that we had was that those people be broken up and assigned to the different migrations that were going to run concurrently, and that worked okay, right? Because we needed to have banner expertise, we needed to have data warehouse expertise, but then we also needed somebody who was an expert in the cloud and what we had done. We wanted to make sure we weren't doing something different for each enterprise system, so we took somebody who was an expert on IBM, but then now an expert in AWS, and put them on the PeopleSoft team. They had no experience with PeopleSoft, but they knew the cloud, so they would help guide them there. So that's kind of how we grew. Um, so I would say 20 to 30 people were involved uh, directly, and there was so many. It was really most of IT was involved indirectly somehow. Oh, more questions, okay. I have a question about the training. You mentioned that you had um, some people on the staff write a web application. And I'm wondering if you could say some more about that and um, how many people were doing it. Was it just one application or did it different things that different people did? It was just a really simple single application that wasn't the most critical thing. It was like an ide ideation kind of tool. We wanted people to submit ideas, kind of like, um, I don't know, like ideas they had that they kind of crowdsource as a group. So it was a nice to have application. Um, that was a smaller group, I want to say it was about five to seven people, but that group was all then moved over to identity management. So it really was just, we just needed to prove to ourselves that it was even possible, right? That we weren't, there weren't a lot of schools moving enterprise applications when we started this in 2016. And while we knew it should be possible, there wasn't a lot of proof that it was possible, so we really needed to build our own confidence. So it was just a simple, small team. The web application was really basic, um, but it allowed us to know that we could move on to identity management. I would have, and I'm, I'm kind of a brave person in this realm, but uh, 
I would have been a little scared to just start with identity management because that, that was already like a little profound to some people. Um, so it was helpful to have the web application to build the confidence of the team and, and our senior management. I think you freaked AWS out with that. Yeah, I like to do that. <laughs> That's my style. All right, thank you.